This is a recording of a lesson before dying by Ernest J. Gaines. Chapter 1. I was not there, yet I was there. No, I did not go to the trial. I did not hear the verdict, because I knew all the time what it would be. Still, I was there. I was there as much as anyone else was there. Either I sat behind my aunt and his godmother, or I sat beside them. Both are large women, but his godmother is larger. She is of average height, 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five, but weighs nearly 200 pounds. Once she and my aunt had found their places, two rows behind the table where he sat with his court-appointed attorney. His godmother became as immobile as a great stone or as one of our oak or cypress stumps. She never got up once to get water or go to the bathroom down in the basement. She just sat there staring at the boy's clean cropped hair where he sat at the front table with his lawyer. Even after he had gone to await the juror's verdict, her eyes remained in that one direction. She heard nothing said in the courtroom, not by the prosecutor, not by the defense attorney, not by my aunt. Oh yes, she did hear one word, one word for sure, hog. It was my aunt whose eyes followed the prosecutor as he moved from one side of the courtroom to the other, pounding his fist into the palm of his hand, pounding the table where his papers lay, pounding the rail that separated the jurors from the rest of the courtroom. It was my aunt who followed his every move, not his godmother. She was not even listening. She had gotten tired of listening. She knew, as we all knew, what the outcome would be. A white man had been killed during a robbery, and though two of the robbers had been killed on the spot, one had been captured, and he, too, would have to die. Though he told them no, he had nothing to do with it, that he was on his way to the White Rabbit Bar and Lounge when Brother and Bear drove up beside him and offered him a ride. After he got into the car, they asked him if he had any money. When he told them he didn't have a solitary dime, it was then that Brother and Bear started talking credit, saying that old Grope should not mind crediting them a pint since he knew them well, and he knew that the grinding season was coming soon, and they would be able to pay him back then. The store was empty, except for the old storekeeper, Alsie Grope, who sat on a stool behind the counter. He spoke first. He asked Jefferson about his godmother. Jefferson told him his nana was all right. Old Grope nodded his head. You tell her for me, I say hello, he told Jefferson. He looked at brother and bear, but he didn't like them. He didn't trust them. Jefferson, Jefferson could see that in his face. Do for you boys, he asked. A bottle of that apple white there, Mr. Grope, bear said. Old Grope got the bottle off the shelf, but he did not set it on the counter. He could see that the boys had already been drinking, and he became suspicious. You boys got money? he asked. Brother and Bear spread out all the money they had in their pockets on top of the counter. Old Grope counted it with his eyes. That's not enough, he said. Come on now, Mr. Grope, they pleaded with him. You know you're going to get your money soon as grinding start. No he said. Money is slack everywhere. You bring the money, you get your wine. He turned to put the bottle back on the shelf. One of the boys, the one called Bear, started around the counter. You stop there, Grope told him. Go back. Bear had been drinking and his eyes were glossy. He walked unsteadily, grinning all the time as he continued around the counter. Go back, Grope told him. I mean the last time now. Go back. Bear continued. Grope moved quickly toward the cash register, where he withdrew a revolver and started shooting. Soon there was shooting from another direction. When it was quiet again, Bear, Group, and Brother were all down on the floor, and only Jefferson was standing. He wanted to run, but he couldn't run. He couldn't even think. He didn't know where he was. He didn't even know how he had gotten there. He couldn't remember ever getting into the car. He couldn't remember a thing he had done all day. He heard a voice calling. He thought the voice was coming from the liquor shelves. Then he realized that old Grope was not dead and that it was he who was calling. He made himself go to the end of the counter. 
he had to look across bare to see the storekeeper. Both lay between the counter and the shelves of alcohol. Several bottles had been broken, and alcohol and blood covered their bodies as well as the floor. He stood there, gaping at the old man slumped against the bottom shelf of gallons and half gallons of wine. He didn't know whether he should go to him or whether he should run out of there. The old man continued to call, Boy! 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 Jefferson became frightened. The old man was still alive. He had seen him. He would tell on him. Now he started babbling. It wasn't me. It wasn't me, Mr. Grope. It was brother and bear. Brother shot you. It wasn't me. They made me come with them. You got to tell the law that, Mr. Grope. Can you hear me, Mr. Grope? But he was talking to a dead man. Still, he did not run. He didn't know what to do. He didn't believe that this had happened. Again, he couldn't remember how he had gotten there. He didn't know whether he had come there with brother and bear, or whether he had walked in and seen all this after it happened. He looked from one dead body to the other. He didn't know whether he should call someone on the telephone or run. He had never dialed a telephone in his life. He had seen other people use them. He didn't know what to do. He was standing by the liquor shelf, and suddenly he realized he needed a drink and needed it badly. He snatched a bottle off the shelf, wrung off the cap, and turned up the bottle, all in one continuous motion. The whiskey burned him like fire, his chest, his belly, even his nostrils. His eyes watered. He shook his head to clear his mind. Now he began to realize where he was. Now he began to realize fully what had happened. Now he knew he had to get out of there. He turned. He saw the money in the cash register under the little wire clamps. He knew taking money was wrong. His nanon had told him never to steal. He didn't want to steal, but he didn't have a solitary dime in his pocket. And nobody was around, so who could say he stole it? Surely not one of the dead men. He was halfway across the room, the money stuffed inside his jacket pocket, the half bottle of whiskey clutched in his hand when two white men walked into the store. That was his story. The prosecutor's story was different. The prosecutor argued that Jefferson and the other two had gone there with the full intention of robbing the old man and then killing him so that he could not identify them. When the old man and the other two robbers were all dead, this one, it proved the kind of animal he really was, stuffed the money into his pockets and celebrated the event by drinking over their still bleeding bodies. The defense argued that Jefferson was innocent of all charges, except being at the wrong place at the wrong time. There was absolutely no proof that there had been a conspiracy between himself and the other two. The fact that Mr. Grope shot only brother and bear was proof of Jefferson's innocence. Why did Mr. Grope shoot one boy twice and never shoot at Jefferson once? because Jefferson was merely an innocent bystander. He took the whiskey to calm his nerves, not to celebrate. He took the money out of hunger and plain stupidity. Gentlemen of the jury, look at this, this, this boy. I almost said the man, but I can't say man. Oh, sure, he has reached the age of 21 when we, civilized men, consider the male species has reached manhood. But would you call this, this? this a man? No, not I. I would call it a boy and a fool. A fool is not aware of right and wrong. A fool does what others tell him to do. A fool got into that automobile. A man with a motocrum of intelligence would have seen that those racketeers meant no good, but not a fool. A fool got into that automobile. A fool rode to the grocery store. A fool stood by and watched this happen, not having the sense to run. Gentlemen of the jury, look at him. Look at him. Look at this. Do you see a man sitting here? Do you see a man sitting here? I ask you. I implore you. Look carefully. Do you see a man sitting here? Look at the shape of this skull. This face as flat as the palm of my hand. Look deeply into those eyes. Do you see a modicum of intelligence? Do you see anyone here who could plan a murder, a robbery? Can plan, can plan, can plan anything? 
a cornered animal to strike quickly out of fear, a trait inherited from his ancestors in the deepest jungle of blackest Africa. Yes, yes, that he can do. But to plan? To plan, gentlemen of the jury. No, gentlemen, this skull here holds no plans. What you see here is a thing that acts on command, a thing to hold the handle of a plow, a thing to load your bales of cotton, a thing to dig your ditches, to chop your wood, to pull your corn. That is what you see here, but you do not see anything capable of planning a robbery or a murder. He does not even know the size of his clothes or his shoes. Ask him to name the months of a year. Ask him, does Christmas come before or after the 4th of July? Mention the names of Keats, Byron, Scott, and see whether the eyes will show you one moment of recognition. Ask him to describe a rose, to quote one passage from the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. Gentlemen of the jury, this man planned a robbery? Oh, pardon me, pardon me. I surely did not mean to insult your intelligence by saying man. Would you please forgive me for committing such an error? Gentlemen of the jury, who would be hurt if you took this life? Look back to that second row. Please look. I want all 12 of you honorable men to turn your heads and look back to that second row. What you see there has been everything to him. Mama, grandmother, godmother, everything. Look at her, gentlemen of the jury. Look at her well. Take this away from her, and she has no reason to go on living. We may see him as not much, but he's her reason for existence. Think on that, gentlemen. Think on it. Gentlemen of the jury, be merciful. For God's sake, be merciful. He is innocent of all charges brought against him. But let us say he was not. Let us for a moment say he was not. What justice would there be to take this life? Justice, gentlemen? Why would I just as soon put a hog in the electric chair as this? I thank you, gentlemen, from the bottom of my heart for your kind patience. I have no more to say except this. We must live with our own conscience. Each and every one of us must live with his own conscience. The jury retired, and it returned a verdict after lunch. Guilty of robbery and murder in the first degree. The judge commended the twelve white men for reaching a quick and just verdict. This was Friday. He would pass sentence on Monday. Ten o'clock on Monday, Ms. Emma and my aunt sat in the same seats they had occupied on Friday. Reverend Moles Ambrose, the pastor of their church, was with them. He and my aunt sat on either side of Miss Emma. The judge, a short, red-faced man with snow-white hair and thick black eyebrows, asked Jefferson if he had anything to say before the sentencing. My aunt said that Jefferson was looking down at the floor and shook his head. The judge told Jefferson that he had been found guilty of the charges brought against him and that the judge saw no reason that he should not pay for the part he played in this horrible crime. Death by electrocution. The governor would set the date. Chapter 2 When I came home from school that afternoon, I saw my aunt and Miss Emma sitting at the table in the kitchen. I was sorry now that I had come directly home, because Miss Emma was the last person I wanted to see. Just like everyone else in the quarter, I knew what the sentence was going to be, and I didn't want to have to look into her face. I hurried to my room with the satchel of papers that I had brought from school to work on that night. After laying the satchel on the table that I used as a desk, I sat down on the bed as quietly as I could. Neither my aunt nor Miss Emma had seen me come in, but they knew it was the time of day for me to be there. I tried to think of a way to make a quick appearance in the kitchen for courtesy's sake and then leave. I didn't want to look into that face any more than I had to. It was late October, and though I wore a wool shirt under my jacket, it was a little cold. I thought how nice it would be to sit inside the Rainbow Club in Bayonne. I had a lot of work to do, but I didn't feel like being here, not as long as Miss Emma was in the house. 
I couldn't hear a sound from the kitchen. I wondered if I could sneak out of the house before my aunt saw me. I got up from the bed, and I was near the door when I heard footsteps in her bedroom. I hurried back to the table and took some papers out of the satchel. When she came into my room, I had sat down at the table and was pretending to read. She stood looking at me. Ain't you going to speak to me, Miss Emma? She said. I was going to. I was just looking over some papers. She won't talk to you. What about? I asked. She can tell you. I have to go to Bayoni. Tante Lou, I said. Something for the school. I'm sure this won't take all day. The store closes at five, Tante Lou, I said. It's almost four now. You can spare a few minutes, my aunt said, especially today. She didn't say any more. She didn't have to. I was sure I knew what had happened. We looked at each other a moment, and then I looked down at the student's paper that I had taken from the satchel. The fourth grade writing was nearly illegible, but even if it had been typed, I would not have been able to concentrate long enough to read it. My aunt, standing back watching me, knew I was not reading. I pushed the papers away and followed her through her room back into the kitchen. Miss Emma sat at the kitchen table, staring out into the yard. I started to speak to her, but I wasn't sure that she even knew I was there. Sit down, Grant, my aunt said. I can stand, Tante Lou. Sit down, she said. She sat down first next to Miss Emma so that I would have to sit opposite both of them. In this way, they could look at me at the same time or take turns. How are you, Miss Emma? I said. Making out, she said. She stared out into the yard. My aunt looked down at the table and I waited, afraid to even think what Miss Emma might want to speak to me about. Miss Emma was in her early or mid-70s. My aunt was in her 70s, and I figured they were pretty much the same age. Miss Emma's hair was gray and combed up and pinned on top. I noticed her floppy brown felt hat and her overcoat on my aunt's bed on our way back into the kitchen. Her name was Emma Glenn, but no one except her closest friends and the white people on the river ever called her anything but Miss Emma. Her husband, who was dead now, had called her Miss Emma, and she had called him Mr. Oscar, and that is how we on the plantation had grown up addressing them, except for Jefferson. He called her Nanan, and he had called Mr. Oscar Perrin, godmother and godfather. Miss Emma continued to stare into the yard, but I was sure she was not seeing anything out there. There was nothing out there to see but the jimson weeds and crabgrass and the rows of cane that ran parallel to the yard and about a hundred feet away from the kitchen where we sat. Miss Emma was not seeing any of that. She was remembering. She was thinking. She was not seeing. Call him a hog. She said that and it was quiet again. My aunt looked at me, then back down at the table. I waited. I know he was just trying to get him off, but they didn't pay that no mind. Still give him death. She turned her head slowly and looked directly at me. Her large, dark face showed all the pain she had gone through this day, this past weekend. No, the pain I saw in that face came from many years past. I don't want them to kill no hog, she said. I want a man to go to that chair on his own two feet. I waited, not knowing what was coming. But she was finished talking. Now both she and my aunt looked at me as though I was supposed to figure out the rest of it. We stared at one another a few seconds before what they expected began to dawn on me. Wait, I said, wait. Neither one said a thing until I started to get up, and my aunt told me to sit back down. Sit down for what? I asked her. Just sit down, she said. I settled back on the chair, but not all the way back. I was ready to get up at any moment. He don't have to do it, Miss Emma said, looking beyond me again. Do what? I asked her. You don't have to do it, she said again. It was dry, mechanical, unemotional, but I could tell by her face and by my aunt's face that they were not about to give up on what they had in mind. What do you want me to do? I asked her. What can I do? It's only a matter of weeks, a couple months maybe. What can I do that you haven't done the past 21 years? 
You, the teacher, she said. Yes, I'm the teacher, I said. And I teach what the white folks around here tell me to teach, reading, writing, and arithmetic. They never told me how to keep a black boy out of a liquor store. You watch your tongue, sir, my aunt said. I sat back in the chair and looked at both of them. They sat there like boulders, their bodies, their minds immovable. He don't have to, Miss Emma said again. He going to do it, my aunt said. Oh, I said. You going to do it, she said. We going up there and talk to Mr. Henry. Talk to Henry Pichot? For what? I asked her. So you have the right to visit Jefferson. What's Henry Pichot got to do with this? His brother-in-law is the sheriff, ain't he? I waited for her to say more, but she did not. I got up from the table. And where you think you going? Tante Lou asked me. To Bayonne, where I can breathe, I said. I can't breathe here. You ain't going to know Bayonne till you go up the quarter, she said. You going to see Mr. Henry at, with me and Emma there. I had walked away, but now I came back and leaned over the table toward both of them. Tante Lou, Miss Emma, Jefferson is dead. It is only a matter of weeks, maybe a couple of months, but he's already dead. The past 21 years, we've done all we could for Jefferson. He's dead now, and I can't raise the dead. All I can do is try to keep the others from ending up like this. But he's gone from us. There's nothing I can do anymore. Nothing any of us can do anymore. You going up with us the quarter? My aunt said as though I hadn't said a word. You going up there with us, Grant? Or you don't sleep in this house tonight? I stood back from the table and looked at the both of them. I clamped my jaws so tight the veins in my neck felt as if they would burst. I wanted to scream at my aunt. I was screaming inside. I told her many, many times how much I hated this place and all I wanted to do was get away. I had told her I was no teacher. I hated teaching and I was just running in place here. She had not heard me before, and I knew that no matter how loud I screamed, she would not hear me now. I'm getting my coat, and I'll be ready to go, she said. E Emma? Chapter 3 My gray 46 Ford was parked in front of the house. Tante Lou, in her black overcoat and black rimless hat, and Miss Emma in her brown coat with the rabbit fur around the collar and sleeves and her floppy brown felt hat followed me out to the car and stood back until I had opened the door for them. Not only was I going up to Henry Pichot's house against my will, but I had to perform all the courtesies of chauffeur as well. After they had settled in the back seat, filling it completely, I slammed the door and went around to the other side and got in. I could feel my aunt's eyes on the back of my neck for shutting the door as I did. Miss Emma probably would have looked at me the same way, but her mind was on other things. As I drove by the church where I taught, I thought about all the work I had to do, and I remembered, reminded myself that I had to see one of the men on the plantation about getting a load of firewood for the heater. I tried to remember who had brought us the last wagon load of wood. Fifteen or twenty families sent their children to the school, and I always made it a point. They expected it of me to ask them to do something for the school during the six-month session. I would ask one of the older children to tell me who had brought in the last load of wood. I stopped at the side gate to Henry Pichot's large white and gray antebellum house. When my aunt started to get out of the car to open the gate for me, I told her to keep her seat because I had nothing to do all that day but serve. I felt her eyes on the back of my neck again, then on the side of my face as I pushed open the gate, and on me directly as I came back to the car. After driving into the yard, I had to get out again to shut the gate. Since the side entrance from the quarter to the house, Henry Pichot never used this gate. Only tractors, wagons, and trucks used this entrance, and over the many years, they had cut just as many ruts across the yard. I must have hit every one of them driving up to the house. My aunt never said a thing, but I could feel her eyes on the back of my neck. I was not aiming for the ruts, but I wasn't avoiding them either. 
I could hear them bouncing on the back seat, but they never said a word. After parking under one of the great live oaks, not far from the back door, I turned around to look at my aunt. Am I supposed to go in there too? She looked at me, but she didn't answer me. She thought I had hit those ruts on purpose. It was you who said you never wanted me to go through that back door ever again. Do I have to keep reminding you, Grant, this ain't just another day? We don't have to go, Miss Emma said for about the hundredth time. She was looking at me but not seeing me and not meaning what she was saying either. He's going, my aunt said. She was definitely seeing me. Mr. Henry won't come to him. Oh, yes, I keep forgetting that, I said. Mr. Henry won't come to me. After a minute of grunting and straining, they were able to get out of the car. I followed them into the inner yard, up the stairs to the back door. The maid, Inez Lane, had seen us come into the yard, and she opened the door for us. Inez was in her early 40s, I suppose. She wore a white dress, white shoes, a blue gingham apron, and a kerchief on her head. She had a dark mole on her left cheek. She nodded to my aunt and me and spoke to Miss Emma. I heard, she said. I would like to speak to Mr. Henry if he's home, Miss Emma said. Talking to Mr. Lewis in the library, Inez said. Like to speak to him if he don't mind, Miss Emma said. Inez nodded and left us. I looked around the kitchen. I had come into this kitchen many times as a small child to bring in wood for the stove, to bring in a chicken I had caught and killed, eggs I found in the grass, and figs, pears, and pecans I had gathered from the trees in the yard. Miss Emma was the cook up here then. She wore the white dress and white shoes and the kerchief around her head. She had been here long before I was born, probably when my mother and father were children. She had cooked for the old Pichots, the parents of Henry Pichot. She had cooked for Henry and his brother and sister, as well as for his nieces and nephews. He did not have any children of his own. She cooked, she ran the house, my aunt washed and ironed, and I ran through the yard to get the things they needed to cook or cook with. As a child growing up on this plantation, I could not imagine this place, this house, existing without the two of them here. Before I left for the university, my aunt sat me down at the table in our kitchen and said to me, Me and Emma can make out all right without you coming through that back door ever again. I had not come through that back door ever since, once leaving for the university ten years before. I had been teaching on the place going on six years, and I had not been in Pichot's yard, let alone go on up the back stairs or through that back door. I saw both my aunt and Miss Emma looking around the kitchen. Some things had changed since they left. Others had not. The big black iron pot still hung against the wall. But the wood-burning oven that I had known and that they had known had been exchanged for a gas range. And a big white refrigerator had taken the place of a smaller ice box. The war had changed all that. After so many of the young colored men had gone into military service or left the plantation, there was no one to chop the wood or haul the ice. And when they left, so did the old people, my aunt and Miss Emma. I did not hear Inez knock on the library door or hear her call, but I did hear Henry Pichot's voice. Yes, Inez, what is it? Then a moment later, who? And a moment after that, did she say what she wanted? And later, go back there and ask her what she wants. Inez came back into the kitchen. Just tell him I like to speak to him, Miss Emma said. It's important. Inez started back up the hall, but Henry Pichot had already left the library. He was a medium-sized man of medium weight. He wore a gray suit, a white shirt, and a gray and white striped tie. He could have been in his mid-sixties. His hair was white and long. He held a drink. Louis Rogan, who followed him into the kitchen, was taller, heavier, and maybe a year or two younger. He wore a black pinstripe suit, and he also held a drink. Louis Rogan's people owned a bank in St. Adrian, a small town about 15 miles west of Henry Pichot's plantation. Mr. Henry, Mr. Louis, Miss Emma spoke to them. 
My aunt nodded. I didn't. I stood back near the door. What can I do for you, Emma? Bichot asked her. He seemed annoyed that he had been disturbed while he had company. I want to ask you a favor, Mr. Henry, Miss Emma said. He drank from his glass and looked at her. It's Jefferson, she said. Yes, I heard, he said, and waited. I want to ask you a favor. I can't change what had been handed down by the court, he said. I spoke up before the trial. I can't say any more. Yes, sir, she said, but that's not what I come to ask you for. I come to ask you something else. Miss Emma looked tired. She was tired. She wanted to sit down at the table, but no one had offered her a chair. My aunt put her arm around her shoulders to comfort her and to help her stand. I looked at the two white men who raised their glasses. Henry Pichot finished his drink and stuck out his hand. Inez knew what it meant, and she came forward to get the empty glass. Then she turned to Louis Rougon, who had stuck out his glass, empty of everything except two or three small ice cubes of ice. She took the glasses to a liquor counter to refresh the drinks. They called my boy a hog, Mr. Henry, Miss Emma said. I didn't raise no hog, and I don't want no hog to go set in that chair. I want a man to go set in that chair, Mr. Henry. He looked at her, but he didn't say anything. He was waiting for his drink. I'm old, Mr. Henry, she went on. Jefferson going to need me, but I'm too old to be going up there. My heart won't take it. I want you to talk to the sheriff for me. I want somebody else to take my place. That's up to you and Mr. Sam, isn't it? Pichot said, and he took the drink off the tray that Inez held before him. I need you speak for me, Mr. Henry, Miss Emma said. I want the teacher visit my boy. I want the teacher make him know he's not a hog. He's a man. I want him know that before he go to that chair, Mr. Henry. Henry Pichot glanced at me, then looked back at her. I done done a lot for this family in this place, Mr. Henry, she said. All I'm asking you talk to the sheriff for me. I done done a lot for this family over the years. I can't promise anything, he said, and sipped his drink. You can speak to your brother-in-law. And say what? I want the teacher to talk to my boy for me. He looked over her head at me, standing back by the door. I was too educated for Henry Pichot. He had no use for me at all anymore. But just as Miss Emma had given so much of herself to that family, so had my aunt. So Henry Pichot, who cared nothing in the world for me, tolerated me because of my aunt. And what do you plan to do? he asked me. I shook my head. I have no idea. He stared at me, and I realized that I had not answered him in the proper manner. Sir, I added, you think you can change him from a hog to a man in the little time he's got left? I have no idea, sir, I said. But you're willing to try if I can get Mr. Sam to let you go up there? That's what she wants, sir. But you didn't put her up to this? No, sir, I did not, I said. He was finished talking to me. Now he wanted me to look away. I lowered my eyes. When I raised my head, I saw his eyes on her again. I would forget all this if I were you, he said. Let Mose visit him and keep it at that. Reverend Mose will visit him, Miss Emma said. But no, sir, I won't keep it at that. At this point, I would be more concerned about his soul if I were you, Henry said. Yes, sir, I'm concerned for his soul, Mr. Henry, Miss Emma said. I'm concerned for his soul, but I want him to be a man, too, when he go to that chair. Louis Rogan, standing next to Henry Pichot, held his drink without drinking. He could not believe what he was hearing. Henry Pichot looked at me again. He was sure I had put her up to this. I shifted my eyes, and I didn't look in his direction until I heard him speaking to her. Go on home. Forget all this foolishness, he told her. You have done all you could to raise him. Let the law have him now. The law got him, Mr. Henry, Miss Emma said, and they go and kill him. But let them kill a man. Let the teacher go to him, Mr. Henry. I've done, done a lot for this family over the years. 
I know what you've done for this family over the years, he told her. I also know what he did. Or have you forgotten that? I ain't forgotten nothing, Mr. Henry, she said. I know what they say he did. He did it, Henry said, leaving no doubt in his mind. I spoke for him because of you, but all the time I knew he did it. If you say so, Mr. Henry, I say so, he said. That's not what I come up here for, Mr. Henry, Miss Emma said to him. I'm not begging for his life no more. That's over. I just want to see him die like a man. This family owe me that much, Mr. Henry, and I want it. I want somebody do something for me one time before I close my eyes. Somebody got do something for me one time before I close my eyes, Mr. Henry. Please, sir. From where I stood back by the door, I could see my aunt tightening her grip around Miss Emma's shoulders to give her comfort. I'll speak to him, Henry said, but it's up to him, not me. Tell him what I d done done for this family, Mr. Henry. Tell him to ask his wife all I done done for this family over the years. I said I would speak to him, Henry said, obviously becoming more and more impatient with her. When? she asked. Henry Pichot had started to raise his glass because for him the conversation was over. But when Miss Emma spoke again, his hand stopped inches away from his mouth and he lowered the glass. What? When? Whenever I see him, that's when, he said. Now, if you don't mind, I have a guest. He drank and turned away. Mr. Henry, Miss Emma called him, but he kept walking. I'll be up here again tomorrow, Mr. Henry. I'll be on my knees next time you see me, Mr. Henry. But she was speaking to empty space. Henry, Pichot, and Louis Rogan were already in the library. Miss Emma continued to stare up the hall for a moment. Then she and my aunt turned away and I held the door open for them to go outside. The sun had gone down, and it was getting colder. Chapter 4 I took them back down the quarter. When I stopped in front of Miss Emma's house, my aunt got out of the car with her. I'm going to Bayoni, I told my aunt. She had not shut the door yet. I'll be home to cook in a little while, she said. I'll eat in town, I told her. Tante Lou held the door while she stood there looking at me. Nothing could have hurt her more when I said I was not going to eat her food. I was supposed to eat soon after she had cooked, and if I was not at home, I was supposed to eat as soon as I came in. She looked at me without saying anything else. Then she closed the door quietly and followed Miss Emma into the yard. I turned the car around and started up the quarter again. There was not a single telephone in the quarter, not a public telephone anywhere, that I could use before reaching Bayoni, and Bayoni was 13 miles away. After leaving the quarter, I drove down a graveled road for about two miles, then along a paved road beside the St. Charles River for another 10 miles. There were houses and big live oak and pecan trees on either side of the road, but not as many on the riverbank side. There, instead of houses and trees, there were fishing wharfs, boat docks, nightclubs, and restaurants for whites. There were one or two nightclubs for colored, but they were not very good. As I drove along the river, I thought about all the schoolwork that I should have been doing at home. But I knew that after being around Miss Emma and Henry Pichot the past hour, I could not have been able to concentrate on my work. I needed to be with someone. I needed to be with Vivian. Bayoni was a small town of about 6,000, approximately 3,500 whites, approximately 2,500 colored. It was the parish seat for St. Raphael. The courthouse was there, so was the jail. There was a Catholic church uptown for whites, a Catholic church back of town for colored. There was a white movie theater uptown, a colored movie theater back of town. There were two elementary schools uptown, one Catholic, one public for whites, and the same back of town for colored. Bayoni's major industries were a cement plant, a sawmill, and a slaughterhouse, mostly for hogs. There was only one main street in Bayoni, and it ran along the St. Charles River. The department stores, the bank, the two or three dentists and doctors and attorneys' offices were mostly on this street, which made up less than half a dozen blocks. 
After entering the town, which was marked by the movie theater for whites on the riverbank side of the road, I had to drive another two or three blocks before turning down an unlit road, which led back of town to the colored section. Once I crossed the railroad tracks, I could see the Rainbow Club with its green, yellow, and red arched neon lights. Several cars were parked before the door. One of them, a big white new 48 Cadillac, belonged to Joe Claiborne, who owned the place. A man and a woman came through the door as I got out of my car to go inside. There were probably a dozen people in the place, half of them at the bar, the rest of them sitting at tables with white tablecloths. I spoke to Joe Claiborne and went through a side door into the cafe to use the telephone. The tables in the cafe had checkered red and white tablecloths. Thelma Claiborne was behind the counter. Thelma ran the cafe, and her husband, Joe, ran the bar. I asked her what she had for supper. Smothered chicken, smothered beefsteaks, shrimp stew, she said. There was only one other person in the cafe, and he sat at the counter eating the stewed shrimps. Shrimps any good? I asked Thelma. All my food's good, she said. Shrimps? I told her. While Thelma dished up my food, I went to the telephone in the corner by the toilet. It took Vivian a while to answer, and she didn't sound too happy about it. Did I get you at a bad time? I asked her. Getting these children something to eat, she said. Where are you? The Rainbow Club. Tonight? I need to see you, baby. I need to talk, I said. Is something the matter? I just need to talk to you, baby. That's all. You want to come over here? I can fix you a sandwich. No, I'm going to eat here at the cafe. I'll see if I can get Dora, she said. If I can't, you'll have to come over here. I can't leave the children alone. I understand. Thelma had the stewed shrimps, a green salad of lettuce, tomato and cucumber, and a piece of cornbread, and a glass of water on the counter waiting for me. Anything else to go with that? she asked. This'll do. Here or a table? she asked. The counter's good. What are you doing in town on Monday? she asked. Calling Miss Fine Brown? I nodded. Figures, Thelma said and smiled. Thelma's mouth was full of gold teeth, solid gold as well as gold crowned. She also wore perfume that was strong enough to keep you a good distance away from her. I figured that's where most of their money went, on those gold teeth, that perfume, and payment on the new white Cadillac that Joe had parked before the door. But they were good people, both of them. When I was broke, I could always get a meal and pay later, and the same went for the bar. I talked with Thelma a while after I finished eating. Then I paid her and went back to the other side. Usual? Claiborne asked me. He knew what I drank, but he would always ask. I nodded. What are you doing here on Monday? He asked while pouring me a brandy. I needed a drink, I said. Sure, he said. He poured a glass of ice water and set it on the bar beside the brandy. I think I know now, he said. Car lights had just flashed upon the front of the club, and I could hear the tires on the crushed seashells just right of the door. And sure enough, it was Vivian, and the men at the bar looked around at her when she came in. She was quite tall, five seven, five eight, and she wore a green wool sweater and a green and brown plaid skirt, and both fit her very well. She had soft, light brown skin and high cheekbones and greenish brown eyes, and her nostrils and lips showed some thickness, but not much. Her hair was long and black, and she kept it twisted into a bun and pinned at the back of her head. Vivian Baptiste was a beautiful woman, and she knew it. But she didn't flaunt it. It was just there. She came up to me, and a couple of the other men at the bar nodded and spoke to her. One tipped his hat and called her Miss Lady. You made it, I said. I got Dora. Usual? Claiborne asked her. She nodded toward my drink. Shirley, can you bring it to your table? Claiborne said. It won't tire her out, I hope. Claiborne grunted at me. It was a slow night. The few people at the bar were holding on to their glasses and not buying any more. Shirley, the waitress, was sitting on a bar stool at the far end, and she had not moved once since I had been there. Vivian and I went to a table far over into the corner where we could be alone. I'm glad you came, I said, and kissed her. 
Shirley brought the drinks and set them before us on paper napkins. Before leaving, she looked at me out of the corner of her eye to let me know she didn't like my remark at the bar. Vivian and I touched glasses and drank. What is the matter, Grant? She asked. I just had to see you. Is something the matter? When was the last time I told you I loved you? A second ago. I should say it more often, I said. What is the matter, Grant? She asked me again. You want to leave from here tonight? I asked her. You want to go home and pack your clothes and get the children and leave from here tonight? She looked at me as though she was trying to figure out whether I was serious or not. No, she said. Why not? I asked her. Because the whole thing is just too crazy, she said. People do it all the time. Just pack up and leave. Some people can, but we can't, she said. We're teachers, and we have a commitment. You hit the nail on the head there, lady. Commitment. Commitment to what? To live and die in this blank hole when we can leave and live like other people? How much have you had to drink, Grant? A whole blank barrel of commitment, I said, and raised my glass. Do you want me to leave, Grant? She asked. You know, I don't like it when you talk like that. No, I don't want you to leave. Please don't leave, I told her. She reached over and touched my hand. Then she began to rub the knuckles with her fingers. I need to go someplace where I can feel I'm living, I said. I don't want to spend the rest of my life teaching school in a plantation church. I want to be with you, someplace where we could have a choice of things to do. I don't feel alive here. I'm not living here. I know we can do better someplace else. I'm still married, Vivian said. A separation is not a divorce. I can't go anywhere until this is all over with. That's not what's keeping you here. Even after the, the divorce, you'll still feel committed, I said. And you, Grant? I'm tired of feeling committed. Then why haven't you gone? Because of you. That's not true, Grant, and you know it, she said. We met only three years ago. I was still married, pregnant with my second child. You told me then how much you always wanted to get away. And you did once. You remember that? You went to California to visit your mother and father, but you wouldn't stay. You couldn't stay. You had to come back. Why did you come back, Grant? Why? I want to go now. I want you to go with me. I'm still married, Grant. After the, the divorce? She nodded. After the divorce, I'll do whatever you want me to do, as long as you're responsible for what you do. In other words, if I fail, I would have to blame myself the rest of my life for trying. Is that it? I'll leave all that up to you, Grant, if you still want me after the divorce. I'll always want you, I said, and touched her hand. And if you don't know that by now, I don't know what you do know about me. A couple from one of the other tables had gotten up and chosen a record on the jukebox. It was a blues, the tempo slow. And the two people danced close together. I needed Vivian closer to me than she was now, and I asked her if she wanted to dance. We left the table, and I took her in my arms, and I could feel her breasts through that sweater, and I could feel her thighs through that plaid skirt, and now I felt very good. We danced for a while. I didn't want to say it, but I had to say it. They gave him death, I said. She and I had talked about it on the weekend, and I did not want to talk about it now or even think about it now, but it was the only thing that stayed on my mind. I could feel her body go tense against me. We danced a while. They want me to visit him. That would be nice, Grant. They want me to make him a man before he dies. She stopped dancing, and she stood back to look at me. Her face was twisted into a painful, questioning frown. The public defender, trying to get him off, called him a dumb animal, I told her. He said it would be like tying a hog down into that chair and executing him, an animal that didn't know what any of it was all about. The jury, twelve white men, good and true, still sentenced him to death. Now his godmother wants me to visit him and make him know, prove to these white men that he's not a hog, that he's a man. 
I'm supposed to make him a man. Who am I? God? The record ended, and we went back to our table. I still don't know if the sheriff will even let me visit him. And suppose he did. What then? What do I say to him? Do I know what a man is? Do I know how a man is supposed to die? I'm still trying to find out how a man should live. Am I supposed to tell someone how to die who has never lived? Vivian lowered her head. Suppose I was allowed to visit him, and suppose I reached him and made him realize that he was as much a man as any other man. Then what? He's still going to die. The next day, the next week, the next month. So what will I have accomplished? What will I have done? Why not let the hog die without knowing anything? Vivian raised her head to look at me, and she was crying. I took one of her hands in both of mine. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do this to you. I don't want to do this to you. I just didn't know where else to turn. I want you to come to me, Grant. I want you to always come to me. Shirley walked over to the table to pick up our empty glasses. You all want anything, Ma? She asked. Another round, I told her. She left. I want you to go up there, Vivian said. They make those decisions, sweetheart. I don't. If they say yes, I want you to go for me. For you? For us, Grant. I looked at her and she looked back at me. She had meant what she said. I don't know if I can take it. I really don't. I know you can. I'll need you every moment. I'll be here. Shirley came back with the drinks and set them on clean, dry paper napkins. She looked at me again that same way to let me know she didn't like my remark at the bar earlier. Shirley is still mad, Vivian said after she had gone. I'll leave her a good tip, I said. Vivian raised her glass to me and smiled. You have the most beautiful smile, I said. She smiled again. What are you doing this weekend? I asked her. Homework and housework. What else? Would you like to go to Baton Rouge one night, Friday or Saturday? I'll pay Dora. Friday sounds good, she said. We had friends in Baton Rouge who knew about her pending divorce and knew about my aunt, and they let us stay a while at their place while they went out to a bar. Sometimes we would join them at the bar later. Other times we would just leave the key in an envelope with a thank you note, but we were both getting very tired of that. We touched glasses and finished our drinks. Then we left. Chapter 5 We pledged allegiance to the flag. The flag hung limp from a ten-foot bamboo pole in the corner of the white picket fence that surrounded the church. Beyond the flag, I could see smoke rising from the chimneys in the quarter. And beyond the houses and chimneys, I could hear the tractor harvesting sugarcane in the fields. The sky was ashy gray and the air chilly enough for a sweater. I told the children to go inside and begin their Bible verses. After listening to one or two of the verses, I tuned out the rest of them. I had heard them all many times. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. Jesus wept. And on and on and on. I'd listened to them almost six years, and I knew who would say what, just as I knew what each child would wear to school, and who would or would not know his or her lesson. I knew, too, which of them would do something for themselves, and which of them never would, regardless of what I did. So each day I listened for a moment, then turned it off and planned the rest of the day. My classroom was the church. My classes ranged from primer to sixth grade, my pupils from six years old to 13 and 14. My desk was a table, used as a collection table by the church on Sundays, and also used for the service of the Holy Sacrament on the fourth Sunday of each month. My students' desks were the benches upon which their parents and grandparents sat during church meeting. The students either got down on their knees and used the benches as desks to write upon or used the backs of their books upon their laps to write out their assignments. Ventilation into the church was by way of the four windows on either side and from the front and back doors. Our heat came from a wood-burning stove in the center of the church. There was a blackboard on the back wall and another on the right side wall. 
behind my desk was the pulpit and the altar. There were three pictures on the wall behind the altar. One was a head and chest black and white photo of the minister in a dark suit, white shirt and dark tie. The other two pictures were color prints of Jesus, the Last Supper, and Christ knocking on a door. This was my school. I was supposed to teach six months out of the year, but actually I taught only five and a half months from late October to the middle of April, when the children were not needed in the field. I assigned three of my sixth grade students to teach the primer first and second grades, while I taught third and fourth. Only by assigning the upper grade students to teach the lower grades was it possible to reach all the students every day. I devoted the last two hours in the afternoon to fifth and sixth grades. While the classes separated and moved to their respective areas, I asked my third and fourth graders to go to the back of the church to work on the blackboards. The third grade class would do arithmetic on the board on the back wall, and the fourth graders would write sentences on the board on the right side wall. I moved from one blackboard to the other with my yard-long Westcott ruler. I still felt bad about the problem I was having at home with my aunt. The night before, when I returned from Bayoni, I had gone to her room to say goodnight, but she pretended to be asleep just to avoid speaking to me. And this morning, when I passed her on my way to the kitchen, she said her shoulder, over her shoulder, food there if you want it, or you can go back where you had supper last night. Breakfast was two fried eggs, grits, a piece of salt pork, and a biscuit. I ate at the kitchen table, looking across the yard. The crab grass was wet from the night's heavy dew. I looked back over my shoulder a couple of times, but I couldn't hear my aunt anywhere in the house. After I finished eating, I washed my plate in the pan of soap water that she had left on the shelf in the kitchen window. I tried once more to speak to her before leaving for school. But to avoid me, this time she pretended to make up her bed, which I knew she had already done two hours earlier. At a quarter to nine, I left the house. She had gone out into the garden. Every little thing was irritating me. I caught one of the students trying to figure out a simple multiplication problem on his fingers, and I slashed him hard across the butt with the Westcott ruler. He jerked around too fast and looked at me too angrily for my liking. Your hand, I said. He held out his right hand, palm up. He still held a piece of chalk. Put that chalk down. I can't afford to break it. He passed the piece of chalk to his left hand and held out the right hand to me again. I brought the Westcott down onto his palm. You figure things out with your brains, not with your fingers, I told him. Yes, sir, Mr. Wiggins. He turned back to the board and stared at the problem at least half a minute. It was cold in the back of the church, but standing two feet away from the boy, I could see that he was sweating. He raised his left hand up to his eyes to wipe away tears. Then he stared at the problem again. Well, others have to work too, you know. Yes, sir, Mr. Wiggins. The back of his neck shone with sweat. He wiped his eyes again. Then he wrote down an answer, large, awkward, and of course, incorrect. You used enough chalk for five times that many problems, I told him. Where do you think we're going to get more chalk when this runs out? He didn't answer. Well, I said, I don't know, Mr. Wiggins, he sat, said, staring at the board, not daring to look at me. I'd have to buy it, I said. The school board doesn't give it away. They already gave me what they said was enough for the year. They're not giving us any more. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Yes, sir, Mr. Wiggins. I jerked the piece of chalk out of his hand, corrected the problem, passed the piece of chalk on to another student, and walked away. On the sideboard, one of the girls wearing a gray dress and a black sweater, unpolished brown loafers and unmatching brown stockings, her head a forest of half a dozen two-inch plaits, had written a sentence of six words with a downward slant of nearly a foot. What is that supposed to be? I asked her. She was so terrified by my voice that she jerked around to face me, then staggered back against the board. This, 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 she stuttered while gesturing toward the board with the piece of chalk. That's a, uh, that's a, a simple sentence, Mr. Wiggins. 
that's not a simple sentence, I told her. That's a slanted sentence. A simple sentence is written on a straight line. I reached for the piece of chalk, but in her fear of me, she continued to hold on to it, and I had to pry it out of her hand. I drew three straight lines from one end of the board to the other. Those are straight lines, I said. Do you notice the difference? She nodded her head while looking at me, not at the board. I erased the three lines as well as her slanted sentence. I want you to write me six simple sentences in straight lines, I said and handed her the chalk. You have until the end of the period to do it. The rest of the class, take your seats. I left her standing there trying to figure out where to begin. At the door, I turned back to look at the other classes. They all knew I was in a pretty rotten mood today, and they kept their heads down. I went out into the yard, slapping the Westcott ruler against my leg hard enough to sting it. The cool air felt good on my face, and after standing in the yard a while, I walked to the road. But there was nothing to see out there but a couple of automobiles. My gray Ford parked down the quarter in front of my aunt's house and a car parked alongside the ditch farther up the quarter. Other than that, all there was to see were old gray weather-beaten houses with smoke rising out of the chimneys and drifting across the corrugated tin roofs. Living and teaching on a plantation, you got to know the occupants of every house, and you knew who was home and who was not. I knew that the parents of the older brothers and sisters of the boy I had slashed on the butt with my ruler were out in the field and that the old grandma, Aunt June, was at home cooking dinner for them to eat when they came in at noon. I could see the smoke rising from the kitchen chimney of the girl who stuttered, and I knew that she came from a family of twelve, and that she had a pregnant older sister, who was not allowed to come back to school, but had to work in the field with all the others, and that she had an idiot brother and a tyrant father and that the father beat the pregnant girl and any other member of the family, including the mother, but would never touch the idiot, whom he showered with love. I could look at the smoke rising from each chimney, or I could look at the rusted tin roof of each house, and I could tell the lives that went on in each one of them. I went all the way to the back of the yard, where I used the boys' toilet. Then I returned to my classes. But instead of coming in through the front door as I left, I entered through the back. Most of the students remembered the mood I was in and had their heads in their books. But one first grader had forgotten or didn't care, and he found time to play with a bug on the sleeve of his sweater. As I watched from the back door, he let the insect crawl an inch or two from his elbow toward his hand. Then he picked it up and returned it up his arm to let it start all over again. I looked at Irene Cole, my student teacher, to let her know not to warn him, and when I got in good striking distance of his nearly shaved head, I brought the Westcott down on his skull, loud enough to send a sound throughout the church. He jumped, hollered, grabbed at the already swelling knot. One or two of the students near him giggled nervously, but most remembered the mood I was in and seemed petrified. The boy with his hand cupped over the welt was crying now. Take that thing outside, get rid of it, and get back in here, I told him. He left crying quietly, the little red bug sitting on top of his extended arm. So it's, if it's bug playing time, huh? I asked the rest of the class. You think that's why I'm here? So that you can play with bugs, huh? The boy came back and sat down. His hand was still cupped over his scalp, and he was still crying. The rest of you, back to your seats, I ordered. They moved hurriedly, quietly, careful not to utter a word. Do you all know what is going on in Bayoni? I asked them back at my desk. Do you all know what is going to happen to someone just like you, who sat right where you're sitting only a few years ago? All right, I'll tell you. They're going to kill him in Bayoni. They're going to sit him in a chair. They're going to tie him down with straps. They're going to connect wires to his head, to his wrists, to his legs, and they're going to shoot electricity through the wires into his body until he's dead. I looked across the room at them. Some stared back at me, others down at the floor, but they were all listening. 
They knew Jefferson was supposed to die in the electric chair, but they hadn't known how this would happen. They had not been explained to them so vividly before, and maybe not at all. I could see how painful it was for most of them to hear this, but I did not stop. Do you know what his Nanan wants me to do before they kill him? The public defender called him a hog, and she wants me to make him a man. Within the next few weeks, maybe a month, whatever the law allows, make him a man. Exactly what am I trying to do here with you now to make you responsible young men and young ladies? But you, you prefer to play with bugs. You refuse to study your arithmetic, and you prefer writing slanted sentences instead of straight ones. Does that make any sense? Well, does it? No one answered. Most averted their eyes. I noticed that the girl whom I had criticized at the blackboard had lowered her head and was crying. Estelle, leave the class if you can't control yourself, I ordered her. She shook her head, but she did not get up or look at me. I'm, I'm all, all right, Mr. Mr. Wiggins, but, but that's my cousin. I knew that Jefferson was her cousin, but I didn't apologize for what I had said, nor did I show any sympathy for her crying. Either leave the class or stop crying, I told her again. She wiped her eyes, but she did not look up. All right, the rest of the morning for studying, I told them. And you'd better study, because I'm testing everybody this afternoon. At two o'clock, I was at the blackboard with my fifth graders when we heard a knocking on the front door. I told the boy nearest the door to see who it was and ask him to come in. The boy went to the door and came back alone. He said that it was Mr. Farrell Giraud, but Mr. Farrell didn't want to come in. I told the class to go on with their work, and I went to the door to see what he wanted. Farrell Giraud was a small, light round man in his late fifties. He wore an old felt hat, a khaki suit, and worn work shoes. He was the yardman and all-round handyman for Henry Pichot. He fixed and sharpened tools for the big house, and he served as carpenter for the people in the quarter. He had made more benches, fixed more chairs and steps than you could number. He took off his hat as I approached him. He had known me all my life, and he knew my aunt and all my people before me. But since I had gone off to the university and returned as a teacher, he treated me with great respect. I went down the steps and into the yard. Professor, Mr. Farrell, he, he say it be all right if you come up by five this evening. Is this about Jefferson, I asked. Didn't tell me. Just say it be all right if you come up there about five. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. My pleasure, Professor, he said. He put on his hat and I noticed his eyes. He knew why Henry Pichot wanted me up there all right, but Henry Pichot had not thought it was necessary to tell him. At his age, he was still only a messenger to run errands. To learn anything, he had to attain it by stealth or through an innate sense of things around him. He nodded to me, knowing that I knew he knew why Henry Pichot wanted to see me, and he walked away, head down. Chapter 6 Inez was in the kitchen when I came up the back stairs, and she opened the door before I had a chance to knock. I could tell she had been crying. She had wiped the tears from her cheeks, but I could see the marks under her eyes. How are you, Inez? I'm making out, she said, not looking at me. You know why he sent for me? Mr. Sam coming here at five. I glanced at my watch. It was ten minutes to five. Can I get you a cup of coffee? Inez asked. No, thanks. You want to sit down? She still did not look at me. I'm all right. I don't mind standing. I remembered how my aunt and Miss Emma had stood the night before. I don't know, Inez said, shaking her head. I just don't know. Mr. Lewis in there trying to get a bet. A bet on what? She looked at me directly for the first time. She had large eyes, brown and kind. I could see traces of tears that she had tried wiping away. You can't get him ready to die. Henry 
Pichot didn't take that bet, did he? I left them in there talking. Mr. Lewis says he got a whole case of whiskey he can bet on. Henry Pichot? He ain't betting against you. He ain't betting on you neither. Smart man. Inez looked at me sadly. I didn't know if it was because of my cynicism or the task I had facing me. She went back to the stove. With a dish towel, she lifted the lid of one of the pots, and I could smell a strong scent of onion, bell pepper, and garlic. She raised the lids on two other pots, but still the odor of the onions, pepper, and garlic pervaded the room. Inez left the room. I heard her knock on the library door, and I could hear her and Henry Pichot talking. Then she came back into the kitchen. How's Lou? she asked me. She's all right, I said. I left her there with Miss Emma. I thought about them sitting at the kitchen table at Miss Emma's house. I had gone home after school to drop off my satchel, and when I did not find my aunt at home, I figured she was keeping Miss Emma company. I found them at the kitchen table, shelling pecans into two big aluminum pans. I could see that neither my aunt nor Miss Emma had any intention of going up to Henry Pichot's house with me. But if you need me to hold your hand, I'd be glad to go, my aunt said. I didn't want him doing nothing he didn't want to do, Miss Emma repeated the old refrain I had heard about a hundred times the day before. I didn't answer them. I was angry already, and I knew things would have gotten worse if I said anything else. I went back outside and got into my car and drove up to Pichot's. Now I looked at my watch again. It was 515 no Sam Gildry and no one else except Inez had come into the kitchen to say anything to me. Each time she returned from the library, Inez seemed more agitated. She knew she was feeling sorry. I knew she was feeling sorry for me. At 5.30, we heard people entering the house off the front gallery. Inez left the kitchen to meet them. She spoke to Edna Gildry, then to Sam um, Gildry, and to one or two other people. I could hear them talking as they came into the house. Inez returned to the kitchen with two empty glasses to be freshened. She added four glasses to her tray. She took that to the library and came back. I'm sure it won't be too long now, she said. She knew how I felt and she was trying to encourage me. It was quarter to six. At six o'clock, Edna Guidry came back in the kitchen. A tall woman in her early fifties, she had light brown hair, a narrow face, and gray eyes. She wore a shapeless black dress, gray stockings, and low-heeled black shoes. Well, Grant, Grant, how are you? She said, smiling and coming up to me with her hand out. She stopped a good distance back, and I had to lean forward to shake her hand, which was long and bony and cold from her glass. Why, Grant, she said, I do declare, I haven't seen you in God knows how long. Been two, three years, I'm sure. Wouldn't you say? About that long, Miss Edna, I said. God, yes, she said. Why, you're looking just as fine like you're living the good life, doesn't he, Inez? He's looking just fine, Miss Edna, Inez said from the stove. Well, tell me all about yourself, Edna Guidry said to me. How have you been? No, no need to tell me. I can see you're doing just fine. But how is Lou? Why doesn't she come to see me? It's been how long? Oh, I bet you it's been six, no, eight months and living so close. You tell Lou, I say, make you bring her to my house so we can sit down and talk. Lord have mercy do. She turned from me to Inez. Mr. Henry says you may serve any time now, Inez. Yes, ma'am. Inez says. Edna turned back to me. Grant, please tell Emma how sorry I am about Jefferson. I would do it myself, but I'm just too broken up over this matter. I ran into Madame Grope just the other day. Lord, how sad she looks. Just dragging along, poor old thing. I had to put my arms round her. Edna drank from her glass. Tell Emma I'm sorry. I'm sorry for both families. I hear you would like the privilege of visiting Jefferson. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'll leave all that up to you and the sheriff, she said. He'll talk to you after supper. She turned to Inez. Inez, is there anything that I may help you with? No, ma'am, I got everything under control, Inez told her. 
Well, in that case, I may as well help myself to another quick shot. She poured about two ounces of bourbon into her glass and added ice cubes. After drinking half of it, she went back to the library. Inez dished up the food. She had cooked a pot roast with potatoes and carrots, onions, bell pepper, and garlic. She also had rice and mustard greens, green peas, and cornbread. She took the platters and bowls to the dining room. Can I fix you something? She asked me when she came back to the kitchen. No, thank you, I told her. I was hungry. I hadn't eaten anything but a sandwich since breakfast, but I would not eat at Henry Pichot's kitchen table. I had come through that back door against my will, and it seemed that he and the sheriff were doing everything they could to humiliate me even more by making me wait on them. Well, I had to put up with that because of those in the quarter. But I darn sure would not add hurt to injury by eating at his kitchen table. Inez went to the dining room and came back. They're talking up there now about him, she said. Sheriff says he don't like the idea at all, saying nobody can make that thing a man, saying might as well let him go like he is. I hope that's his final word, I said. I sure would relieve my mind. Why don't you sit down, Inez says. You'll feel better. I'd rather stand. You sure I can't fix you something little to eat? No, thank you, Inez. She went and came back. It won't be long now, she said. They're nearly through. Soon as I serve the coffee. You sure I can't get you a cup of coffee? No, thanks. I appreciate it, though. She poured coffee into half a dozen white, small white cups and took the sh coffee, sugar, and cream to the dining room on a silver tray. She came back. He asked me if you were still here, she said. I think he's going to let you see him, but he say he's still against it. I'm sure it's Miss Edna making him do it. Well, all the time Miss Emma done spent with this family, that ain't asking too much. At a quarter to seven, Inez cleared off the table in the dining room and brought the dishes into the kitchen. Then she took a bottle of brandy back with her. A half hour later, while she was putting away the dishes she had just finished washing, Sam Guidry, Henry Pichot, Louis Ragoon, and another fat man came into the kitchen. I had been standing there nearly two and a half hours. Sam Guidry was a tall man, well over six feet, and he was well tanned. His hair was dark brown. His sideburns and mustache showed some gray. His face was narrow, well lined, and strong. His hands were large and hairy. He wore a brown suit and a tie. He usually wore a Stetson hat and cowboy boots. He had probably left the hat in the library or the dining room, but he had the boots on. The four white men split into pairs. Sam Guidry and Henry Pichot stood on one side of the table, while Louis Rogan and the fat man stood over by the dish cabinet. They had brought their drinks with them. Inez left the kitchen as soon as the white man came in. I tried to decide just how I should respond to them, whether I should act like the teacher that I was or like the blank that I was supposed to be. I decided to wait and see how the conversation went. To show too much intelligence would have been an insult to them. To show a lack of intelligence would have been a greater insult to me. I decided to wait and see how the conversation would go. Been waiting long, Sam Guidry asked me. About two and a half hours, sir, I said. I was supposed to say, not long, and I was supposed to grin, but I didn't do either. The fat man glanced knowingly at Louis Rigon, but Louis Rigon was looking directly at me. I could see in their faces that they had talked all this over, and Sam Guidry had already made up his mind what he was going to do. What can I do for you? he asked. Louis, Ragon, and the fat man waited for my answer. I knew it didn't matter what I said, since Guidry had made up his mind. Henry Pichot, standing next to Guidry, looked more tired than he had the day before. He seemed more sympathetic. Maybe he had been thinking about all the services Miss Emma had provided for his family over the years. It's about Jefferson, Sheriff Guidry, I said. I knew they had discussed it. Still, I had to go through the motions. His nanan would like for me to visit him. For what? Guidry asked. 
They had discussed this too. I could tell from the way the fat man drank from his drink. I could see in his face that he was amused. So was Louis Ragon. I knew they were both betting against me. She's old, I said. She doesn't feel that she has the strength to come up there all the time. She doesn't, huh? Sam Guidry asked me. He emphasized doesn't. I was supposed to have said don't. I was being too smart. Yes, sir, I said. She doesn't feel that she can. I used the word doesn't again, but I did it intentionally this time. If he had said I was being too smart and he didn't want me to come to that jail, my mind would definitely have been relieved. What about that preacher in the quarter? Can't he visit him? I asked her the same thing. You did, huh? Yes, sir. And what did she say? She said there'll be time for the preacher. She did, huh? Yes, sir. So she feels that he has that much time, time for teacher and preacher? The fat man grunted. Louis Ragon's eyes showed that he was amused. Henry Pichot, next to Sam Guidry, looked uncomfortable. What you plan on doing when you come up there, if I let you come up there? Guidry asked me. I have no idea, sir, I told him. You're not trying to play with me now, are you? Guidry asked. No, sir, I'm not, but I have no idea what I'll talk to him about. I hear from people around here you want to make him a man. A man for what, at this time? She asked me to go to him, sir. Her idea, not mine. That was not the question, Guidry said. Make him a man for what? To die with some dignity, I suppose. I suppose that's what she wants. You think that's a good idea? That's what she wants, sir. What do you think? I would rather not have anything to do with it, sir, but that's what she wants. So you think he ought to go just like he is? I don't know how he is, sir. Believe me, Mr. Guidry, if it was left up to me, I wouldn't have anything to do with it at all, I said. You and I are in accord there, he said, but my wife thinks different. Now, which one of you think is right, me or her? The fat man snorted. He thought Guidry had me. I make it a habit never to get into family business, Mr. Guidry. The fat man didn't like that quick maneuver. I could see it in his face. You're smart, Guidry said. Maybe you're just a little too smart for your own good. I was quiet. I knew when to be quiet. I don't like it, Guidry said. And I want you to know I don't like it. Because I think the only thing you can do is just aggravate him, trying to put something in his head against his will. And I'd rather see a contented hog go to that chair than an aggravated hog. It would be better for everybody concerned. There ain't a thing you can put in that skull that ain't there already. I remained quiet. You can come up there, Sam Guidry said. But the first sign of aggravation, I'm calling it off. You understand? Yes, sir. You have any questions? He asked me. Yes, sir. When can I see him? You can come any time you like. Not before 10 in the morning, not after 4 in the evening. Any other questions? Any idea how much time he has left? That's entirely up to the governor, not me, Guidry said. But I wouldn't plan on a diploma, okay? The fat man and Louis Ragon seemed impressed by the sheriff's questions and answers to me. Louis Ragon, who had light blue eyes, stared at me to make me look back at him, but I refused to pay him that courtesy. The fat man, drinking, rattled the ice cubes in his glass. Henry Pichot appeared to wish all this was over with. Anything else? Guidry asked me. When can I start coming up there? Not for a couple of weeks, Guidry said. Let him get used to it. Report to Chief Deputy Clark if I'm not around. Don't bring up anything there you don't want taken away from you. Knife, razor blade, anything made of glass. Not that I expect him to do anything, but you can never be sure. Anything else? No, sir, nothing else. Guidry nodded. Good luck, but I think it's all just a waste of time. Thank you, sir. I waited until they left the kitchen. Then I went out to my car and drove away. Chapter 7 Two things happened at the school during the weeks before I visited Jefferson in jail. 
the superintendent of schools, made his annual visit, and we got our first load of wood for winter. We heard on Monday by Pharaoh Jarreau, who had gotten the news from Henry Pichot, that the superintendent was going to visit us sometime during the week, but we didn't know what day or time. I told my students to take baths each morning and wear their best clothes to school. After the Pledge of Allegiance in the yard and the recitation of Bible verses inside the church, I would send a student back outside to look out for the superintendent. If the student saw a car, any car, turn off the highway down into the quarter, he or she was supposed to run inside and tell me. The superintendent didn't show up until Thursday. By then, we had had many false alarms. The minister of the church, who didn't live in the quarter, had made a couple of visits to church members. A doctor had come once. A midwife had visited a young woman twice. An insurance man had shown up. A bill collector from a furniture store had appeared. Henry Pichot had driven through the quarter at least once each day. And family and friends of people in the quarter had also visited. On Thursday, just before 2 o'clock, the boy I had watching for cars ran into the church. Another one, Mr. Wiggins, another one. All right, I said to the class. Keep those books opened and look sharp. I passed my finger over my shirt collar and checked the knot in my necktie. I felt my jacket to be sure both flaps were outside the pockets. I had three suits, navy, blue, gray, and brown. I had on the blue one today. In the yard, I passed the tips of my shoes over the backs of my pant legs. Now I was ready to receive our guest. This time, it was the superintendent. He stopped his car before the door of the church. A thick cloud of gray dust flew over the top of the car and down into the quarter. The superintendent was a short, fat man with a large red face and a double chin, and he needed all his energy to get out of the car. Dr. Joseph, I said. Hmm, stifling, he said. I thought it was a little cool myself, but I figured that anyone as heavy as he was must have felt stifled all the time. He wheezed his way across the shallow ditch that separated the road from the churchyard. He looked up at me, but I couldn't tell he didn't remember my name, though he had visited the school once each year since I had been teaching there. Grant Wiggins, I said. How are you, Higgins? Wiggins, sir, I said. I'm fine. Well, I'm not, he said. All this running around, more schools to attend. Dr. Joseph visited the colored schools once a year, the white schools probably twice, once each semester. There were a dozen schools in the parish to visit, if that many. We're honored that you took this time for us, sir. He grunted and looked around the yard. There was a good breeze coming in from the direction of the cane fields, and it wavered the flag on the pole in the yard. Place looks about the same, Dr. Joseph said. Things change very slowly around here, Dr. Joseph, I said. Hmm, he said. I motioned for him to precede me into the church. He needed all his strength to go up the three wooden steps, and as he entered the doorway, I heard Irene Cole, the sixth grade student in charge, co opt to the class. Rise, shoulders back. I followed Dr. Joseph down the aisle. On either side of us, the students from primer through sixth grade stood as still and straight as soldiers for inspection. I nodded toward my desk for Dr. Joseph to take my chair. He grunted, which meant thanks, and pulled the chair further from the desk before as he sat down. He needed the extra distance for comfort. Irene was watching me all the time, and when I nodded to her, she called out to the classes, Seats! And the whole school sat as one. We had been rehearsing this morning and afternoon for the past three days. Students, I'm sure you all know Dr. Joseph Morgan, I told them. Dr. Joseph is our superintendent of schools here in St. Raphael Parish. He has taken time out of a very busy schedule to visit us for a few minutes. Please respond loudly. Thank you, Dr. Joseph, which they did loudly. Dr. Joseph acknowledged their greeting. Hmm. Dr. Joseph, we're at your service. I said and sat down on one of the benches against the wall. Dr. Joseph leaned back in the chair and still his large stomach nearly touched the edge of the table. 
He looked over the classes from one side of the aisle to the other, as though he was trying to catch someone doing something improper. Primer, on your feet, he said. They stood up, seven or eight of them. Dr. Joseph looked them over for a moment, then he told the little girl at the end to come forward. She took a deep breath and looked at the girl standing beside her before coming up to the desk. She was afraid, but she came up quickly and stood before the table with her little arms tight to her sides. She would not look up. Nothing to be afraid of, child, Dr. Joseph said to her. What is your name? Gloria Hebert, she said. I can't hear you if you keep your head down, Dr. Joseph told her. She looked up timidly. Gloria Hebert, that's a pretty name, Dr. Joseph said. Hold out your hands. She must have thought she had said or done something wrong because as she held out her hands out across the table, palms up, I could see them trembling. Turn them over, Dr. Joseph told her. She did. Uh-huh, he said. Relax. She did not know what he wanted her to do. Lower your arms, child, Dr. Joseph said. She brought her arms back to her sides and lowered her eyes as well. Did you say your Bible verse this morning, Gloria? Yes, sir, Dr. Joseph. Well, what did you say? He asked her. I said, Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, Dr. Joseph. Hmm, Dr. Joseph said. Seems I've heard of that one before. You're a bright little girl. You tell your folks Dr. Joseph said they ought to be proud of you. Go back to your seat. Thank you, Dr. Joseph, she said, bowing and turning away quickly. She smiled as she faced forward again. No one else was smiling. Primers, take your seat, Dr. Joseph said. First graders, on your feet. And he called on the one boy in class who I wished had stayed home today. He was, without doubt, the worst child in school. He came from a large family, 13, 14, 15, I don't know how many, and he had to fight for every crumb of food he got. At school, he did the same. He fought if he played marbles. He fought if he played ball. He fought if he played hide-and-go-seek. He fought if he played hide-the-switch. In class, he fought with those who sat in front of him, beside him, behind him. I had punished him as much during the last month as I had all the other children put together. Dr. Joseph asked his name, and he ran together three words even I couldn't understand. His name was Lewis Washington, Jr., but what he said didn't sound anything like that. Your hands, Dr. Joseph told him. The hands had been cleaned an hour before, I was sure, because I had checked each pair when the students came in from dinner. But now the palms of those same hands were as black and grimy as if he had been pitching coal all day. Did you pledge allegiance to the flag this morning? Dr. Joseph asked him. Yes, sir, he said. Not Yes, sir, as I told him a hundred times to say, yes, sir. Well, Dr. Joseph said, want me go stand outside and flute flag? The boy asked. You don't have to go outside, Dr. Joseph said. You can show me in here. The boy raised his hand to his chest. Pledge legion to the flag. Nice day, America. Er, er, yeah. Which is Dan, visibly. Amen. Dr. Joseph grunted. Several students giggled. Dr. Joseph seemed quite satisfied. I would have to do a lot more work. For the next half hour, it continued. Dr. Joseph would call on someone who looked half bright. Then he would call on someone who he felt was just the opposite. In the upper grades, fourth, fifth, sixth, he asked grammatical, mathematical, and geographical questions. And besides looking at hands, now he began inspecting teeth. Open wide, say ah, and he would have the poor children spreading out their lips as far as they could while he peered into their mouths. At the university, I had read about slave masters who had done the same when buying new slaves. And I had read of cattlemen doing it when purchasing horses and cattle. At least Dr. Joseph had graduated to the level where he let the children spread out their own lips rather than using some kind of cruel metal instrument. I appreciated his humanitarianism. Finally, when he felt that he had inspected enough mouths and hands, he gave the school a 10-minute lecture on nutrition. 
Beans were good, he said. Not only just good, but very, very good. Beans, beans, beans. He must have said beans a hundred times. Then he said fish and greens were good. And exercise was good. In other words, hard work was good for the young body. Picking cotton, gathering potatoes, pulling onions, working in the garden. All of that was good exercise for a growing boy or girl. Higgins, I must compliment you. You have an excellent crop of students. An excellent crop, Higgins. You ought to be proud. He had said the same thing the year before, and he had called me Higgins then too. And the year before that, he had said the same thing, but he had called me Washington then. At least he was getting closer to my real name. Rise, Irene called to the class. They came to their feet, their heads up, their arms clasped to their sides. But instead of feeling pride, I hated myself for drilling them as I had done. Dr. Joseph and I went down the aisle. Outside, he looked up at the flag waving on its bamboo pole in the corner of the fence. I thought for a moment the superintendent was about to salute it, but he was either too tired or too lazy to raise his hand. Doing a good job, Higgins, he said. I do the best I can with what I have to work with, Dr. Joseph, I said. I don't have all the books I need. In some classes, I have two children studying out of one book. And even with that, some of the pages in the book are missing. I need more paper to write on. I need more chalk for the blackboards. I need more pencils. I even need a better heater. We're all in the same shape, Higgins, he said. I didn't answer him. He said, we're all in the same shape. Higgins, the white schools, just as much as the colored schools. We take what the state gives us and we make the best of it. Many of the books I have to use are hand-me-downs from the white schools, Dr. Joseph, I said, and they have missing pages. How can I? Are you questioning me, Higgins? No, sir, Dr. Joseph, I was just. Thank you, Higgins. He started to get back into his car. It was harder to do than getting out because he was upset with me now. More drill on the flag, Higgins, he said through the road down window, more emphasis on hygiene. Some of these children have never seen a toothbrush before coming to school, Dr. Joseph. Well, isn't that your job, Higgins? Yes, sir, I suppose so. But then I would have to buy them. Can't they work? He asked me. Look at all the pecan trees. He waved his hand toward the yards. I wager you can count 50 trees right here in the quarter. Back in the field, back in the pasture, you can count another hundred, two hundred trees. Get them off their lazy butts. They can make enough for a dozen toothbrushes in one evening. That money usually goes to helping the family, Dr. Joseph. Then you tell the family about health, he said, looking out of the rolled down window to let me know that his visit was over. I have another school to visit. All this running around, enough to give a man a heart attack. He drove away. I stood there until he had turned his car around and started back up the quarter. I waved at him, but he did not wave back.